Just a few days ago, on March 1st, huge crowds gathered in the streets of Moscow to attend the funeral of Alexei Navalny in spite of government efforts to stop any public display of grief or mourning for Navalny. Dozens were arrested, hundreds were detained by police, but still the crowd grew, extending more than a half a mile down the multi-lane street from the church where the funeral was held. Putin had commanded that the body be withheld from his family for more than two weeks, hoping to avoid this display of, of public grieving. But the people of Moscow and many other communities have shown tremendous courage in response to Navalny's death, which seems unavoidably to have been caused by his captors. I've not heard anyone express any surprise that Navalny was murdered in the long, remote prison where he had been sent to. My own surprise was that he lasted as long as he did. He has been Russia's most outspoken critic of the abuses of Vladimir Putin. Twice in 2017, he was attacked by having green dye thrown on him that stained his face and nearly blinded one eye, making it impossible for him to hide in public anywhere. He was clearly being marked for assassination. Navalny had been poisoned in 2020, and he had to flee to Germany for medical treatment that barely saved his life. He's been arrested, he's been imprisoned, and yet against all reason, against any sense of self-preservation, he kept up his good-humored ridicule of Putin's administration, and even after he had been taken out of the country for treatment from this nearly fatal poisoning, as soon as he was able, he boldly decided to return to Russia against the advice of friends and the pleading of family members. I could only wish to be so brave. I know that I couldn't have done it, but Alexei did. And I want to invite us all to spend just a few minutes thinking about what that fact means, and what it represents to us. Why did he do it? What does his sacrifice really mean? And frankly, was it worth it? In theology, we have a term to describe this kind of martyrdom. It's called redemptive suffering. A great deal of our spiritual energy is focused on preventing or ending avoidable suffering. For example, hunger in general is not a matter of there not being enough food. It's a matter of distribution of available food based on profit. And so we are almost always against hunger. But in certain circumstances, we might choose to suffer hunger in order to correct or to redeem a specific social ill. Several students at Dartmouth went on a hunger strike this past month to protest the college's investments in Israel, demanding that the college defund the Israeli war on the people in Gaza. 30 students at Harvard went on a 12-hour hunger strike, which is kind of embarrassing. That's just interval fasting, but several students at Dartmouth were on strike for more than a week. Some lasted as long as 12 days, and some were hospitalized. The strike is over now, and the success of their effort is not yet clear, but the, cor the courageous who chose that kind of hunger to go days and days, more than a week, almost two weeks, to make a point, that courage has to be recognized. Whether you agree with the protest or not, and I'm not even sure that I do, still you can see that it was a noble effort at redemptive suffering. History is littered with examples of people who change their culture through personal sacrifice, through choosing some form of suffering that made people think and then ultimately change the way that people act. 
A strong case can be made for the gospel accounts of the Passion, which started with Mark, that, that the gospel of Mark is basically offering praise of martyrdom, making Jesus an exemplary uh, martyr because of his redemptive suffering. Not that Jesus died for our sins. I don't know about you, but even though I'm far from perfect, I haven't done anything that might require capital punishment or a blood sacrifice to atone to even a bloodthirsty, psychotic God. Jesus died in rebellion against a punitive and evil system while leaving us an example of radical compassion. In that sense, I think the suffering of Jesus is redemptive, not dying on the cross for the sins of others. That theologically doesn't even make sense. More recent examples may be easier for us to get our heads around. I would ask you to consider the case of Nelson Mandela. Though Mandela was heralded as a hero at the end of apartheid in South Africa for most of his life, he was on America's terrorist watch list. He was a Marxist, and though he had personally been nonviolent, he yet maintained that black Africans had every right to use militant action to gain their freedom. He didn't advocate it, but he advocated for their right to do so. He was involved in the ANC, the African National Congress, and he was an active revolutionary in trying to bring down the apartheid government of South Africa. He was arrested and imprisoned in 1962 for his anti-government work, and he was held in prison for 27 years, 18 of which were spent on a rock in the middle of a hot sea, a rock called Robben Island, Prisoners worked there in the blinding sun in temperatures over 100 degrees. While there, he was given a bucket to put in his cell to use as his latrine. He was rarely allowed a visitor, and prisoners had no access to news or mail, just whispers between prisoners, sometimes a scrap of paper with a few words written on it. They were prevented from knowing almost anything about what was going on in the outside world. But he could have been released at any time if he had been willing to publicly swear off violent means of overthrowing apartheid. But he chose instead to suffer, to suffer in hope of the redemption of his people. He didn't even know if anyone knew he was suffering. He could only hope that by choosing to suffer under the heavy hand of the racist government of South Africa, that he might be drawing worldwide attention to the plight of those under apartheid. He only knew from whispers that there was still talk of a free Mandela movement. 27 years. I have to ask you to allow me to make a comparison, but, but when Mandela was freed in 1990, at that time I made an observation to my congregation that the church speaks voluminously of the crucifixion of Jesus, which was admittedly a torturous and horrible death. But folks, it was over in a day. It was over in one day. Mandela spent 27 years in a blisteringly hot cell, doing manual labor, using a bucket in the corner of his cell for a toilet. He was nearly blinded by the sunlight by the time he was released. That's why he is always pictured wearing sunglasses. Even inside, he couldn't stand the light, and he never knew if it was going to end. 27 years of suffering to redeem the plight of his people. I don't think I could have done it for a month. I couldn't have done it for a week. But he came out of that cell to accept the Nobel Peace Prize and to become not only the first black president of South Africa, 
but the first president to be democratically elected by the whole of the population. He just served one term, and then he devoted the rest of his life to working to eradicate poverty and HIV from Africa. South Africa still has serious problems, but the fact that apartheid was ended without a bloody civil war is due in large part to the fact that Mandela was willing to suffer for his people and in the end to work with his white oppressors to turn the nation over to the majority population in a peaceful manner of transfer of power to become a democratic government. I wish that Alexei Navalny's story could have ended with his release from prison, him being elected to be president of Russia, but that's not how it worked out. Nelson Mandela didn't know that his story would end any differently from Navalny's. Thankfully, it did. But Navalny's death is not of lesser value because he was murdered in prison rather than coming out of prison to serve as president. We don't know yet if the courageous crowds in the streets honoring Navalny at the time of his death will continue to maintain that protest. We don't know if time will dilute his influence, but I'm convinced that his cause was right, that his courage is admirable, and I hope that he has seeded in the hearts of the Russian people a vision of what his now widow calls a beautiful Russia. I hope that they have been inspired to believe in their own future enough to not give up the protest. Folks, dictators have power, and autocrats stay in power for one reason. And that reason is because the majority of the population allows it. Those students at Dartmouth believe that most people would not tolerate Israeli government assault on Gaza if they only knew about it. And so they were willing to starve themselves nearly to death to draw attention to the subject. The majority of Americans want sensible gun laws, restrictions on the kinds of weapons that citizens can own, who can own them, as well as regulations of proper training and licensing, insurance and storage. Why, with an outrageous death toll from mass shootings, domestic violence and suicide, can't we get some sensible gun reform? It is only because the public tolerates it. We get upset when school children die in a mass murder, but we rarely stay concerned for more than a few days. I like to blame the NRA. I like to blame the Republican legislators who were bought off by gun lobby donations. But really, seriously, if you want to know who to blame for the fact that we still have 40,000 gun deaths a year, you need only look into the mirror. Just as V says in the famous Vendetta movie, I know why you did it, but if you want to know who's responsible, you need only look in a mirror. It is our acquiescence to an insane set of gun laws that keeps this bloodbath going on. Jesus was murdered by the state. Alexei Navalny was murdered by the state. Nelson Mandela was nearly murdered by the state, as John Lewis was nearly murdered on the Edmund Pettus Bridge by the state. But redemptive suffering is not always played out at those extremes. We're not often asked to run into a burning building to rescue an infant. We're more likely to accept the imperceptible sacrifice of doing something less dramatic, like donating to help pay off the debt incurred by students that can't afford their school lunches, or for us all to accept some diminution of our own health care in order to help families that don't have health care. Let me give you an example from just a very few years ago. In 2020, the Culinary Workers Union in Nevada 
rejected supporting Bernie Sanders as a presidential candidate specifically because he was advocating for Medicare for all. And that would mean that their members would lose the wonderful health care program that the union had fought so hard for for years to win for them. In fact, on the morning of the Nevada primary in 2020, the union was sending text messages to all of their members, encouraging them to vote for absolutely anyone but Bernie Sanders. However, when the Nevada primary was held, the rank and file members actually voted for Sanders by a huge majority. Those who bucked the union leadership explained themselves in clearly moral language. While they appreciate having good health care coverage for themselves, they are aware that keeping a system in place that gives some people great coverage while leaving millions of others without care is morally reprehensible. They were willing to give up their enviable status if it would mean that their relatives, their neighbors, their friends who were sick but who could not get medical care could at least receive basic health care. Of course, Bernie didn't win the Democratic nomination in 2020 because both Democrats and Republicans joined together in labeling him as being crazy because he thought that the United States could have the same kind of universal health care that 32 of 33 developed nations already have. But still, these union members knew how important health care is, and they were willing to have less of it if everyone could have some of it. This, at least in my mind, becomes the major dividing line between the conservative and progressive political wings of our nation. It makes the difference between conservative and progressive churches. It makes the difference between those who use the word socialism as if it were some kind of boogeyman word. It's an economic system that could be a blend of socialism with capitalism, but instead, we seem to be afraid of everything that is done collectively. There is the fear and greed-based perspective of, I got mine, I earned it, I deserve it, and I really don't give a damn what happens to anybody else. Now, that doesn't make it sound very nice, but surely you know what I mean. And again, from my perspective, the progressive view is that our whole society is connected to one another, and we all need to be willing to make personal sacrifices for the good of the whole society. I would love to believe that that would go without saying, but our recent experience with a global pandemic forces us to realize just how self-centered we can be. I mean, you remember the run on toilet paper in early 2020? I never understood the connection between a respiratory virus and toilet paper, but I know that when they finally got resupplied at my local box store, that I had to stand in a long line to receive my ration of toilet paper. I was probably the only single man with a bidet seat installed in my toilet in southern Missouri because, quite frankly, in early 2020, I had run out of options. As in most things, not many of us are made of the kind of stuff to become another Alexei Navalny or a Nelson Mandela or a Martin Luther King or a Gandhi, but we can learn from them. We can strive to be more like them even if we can't strive to be them. We can resist our innate desire to be concerned only with ourselves. You know, we come into the world screaming and crying to be fed, changed, comforted, held, carried. I never understood it when people say, you know, I slept like a baby, because babies really don't sleep all that peacefully. Ask anyone with a newborn in the house. We come into the world screaming and crying to have our personal needs met. And as this pandemic revealed over the past few years, a whole lot of us never grew past that point. To become better than that, we have to choose to be better. We have to choose to consider others, even those who will live on 
when we are gone. I have this piece of good news, a bit of wisdom from Henry David Thoreau, who many years ago, when I came on this quote, 40 some years ago, I have carried it with me in my collection of quotes. Thoreau said, I know of no more encouraging fact than that our that by our unquestionable ability, we can elevate ourselves through our conscious endeavor. Let me say that again. I know of no more encouraging fact than our unquestionable ability to elevate ourselves by conscious endeavor. I'm in awe of Alexei's courage, his moral sacrifice. I am no Alexei Navalny but I do want to choose to become more like him. And I want to invite you by conscious endeavor to choose to be more like him too. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.